Welcome to Nothing Ever Happens in Canada, but we know this is simply not true. I'm Canadian Girl. Thanks for joining me today. This is a Canadian podcast about the myths, legends, and just good old tales Canada has to tell. How's everybody's weather out there? Other than the fact that we have puddles the size of swimming pools from all the melting snow, it's been sunny and beautiful here, so I hope it's been the same for you. Since everything is melting, it will make it easier for what we're about to do today. Unfortunately though, it's going to be a lot messier. Did you bring your adventure gear? A shovel like I reminded you last time in the previous episode? If you didn't, it's okay. I think I have some spare stuff in my bag. Just let me know what you need. We're off to see those Vikings and what they left behind when they set up camp along the east coast of Canada roughly 1,000 years ago. So prepare to get muddy. In order to find this stuff, we're going to have to dig deep. We're going to look at an ancient trade route that some people believe has yet to be discovered between the Native Americans and the Norsemen. We're also going to learn about the mysterious land of Vinland that the famous Viking Leif Erikson went out searching for and found what he claimed to be a land of so many trees and grapes. Another thing we're going to look at is clear quartz crystal stones. They are thought to be a Viking navigational tool used when sailing across the Atlantic Ocean. Join me now as we begin our journey on a Viking ship just setting out in search of new hope, new resources, new land to settle, and a new start. Don't forget your protective amulet. A Viking never travels without the trinkets of their beloved gods who offer protection. In the 8th century, the Norsemen are a group of Germanic people who lived in Scandinavia and spoke what we know now today as Old Norse language. This is a group also commonly referred to as the Vikings. They would set out on a mission looking to expand and settle in new colonies in every direction. Evidence of these settlements can be found all over the world from England, Iceland, Russia, Belgium, Germany, Poland, Ukraine, Ireland, Greenland, Canada, and more. This is when the Viking Age was just beginning and we're right in time to catch the last ship leaving the harbor today with Barney Herjolfsson, a friend of Leif Erikson's. Just gonna say it now, I'm probably not gonna pronounce a lot of these names right, so don't hold me to that. Find a good spot to call home quickly on this ship because it's about a three to four week journey to get where we're going, and we're also going to get lost on this ship. But nobody knows that right now except for us, so we've got even more time to waste before arriving in our true destination of Greenland. That's right, we're sailing to Greenland, the new home of the Norsemen, and that's where we'll meet up with Leif Erikson and set out on our next adventure in search of the mysterious land soon to be known as Finland. Did you grab a sunstone before you left the village? If not, it's okay. I have one in my bag because we're going to need it. There is a theory that Vikings used what is known as a sunstone to navigate the brutal Atlantic Ocean. They are mentioned in the Icelandic saga of St. Olaf. These are oral translations of history that have been passed down and were not transcribed until the 13th century. The sunstone is referred to as what is known as a solar steam in the sagas. They are described in the text as being used on cloudy days or in fog to find the position of the sun. Hold on tight, we're just about to cast off from the port on our very first Viking adventure. Just to break it down a little more for you, the mysterious translucent crystal, said to be like an Icelandic spur if you know your minerals, is able to split the polarization of light passing through it to allow the Norse men to tell the position of the sun on a cloudy day while sailing across the known to be forever cloudy Atlantic Ocean. It is believed that when observing a sunstone from when leaving Norway, it would lead you right to Greenland. A computer simulation was done and did show that if a Viking ship sailing from Norway to Greenland checked their sunstone every one to three hours, they would sail west with a very high chance of making landfall on Greenland shores. But if they did not check their stones that often, 
and only about every six hours or more, they would end up sailing more south, drifting off course and landing on the east coast shores of Canada. Here are our sunstones. Go ahead and take a look for yourself. There is very little archaeological evidence for the use of these said crystals as a navigational tool. The more widely believed opinion is that the Vikings used a non-magnetic sun compass to measure the angle of the sun at midday, which would enable them to steer in a direct line of latitude west, straight to Greenland if they wanted to. Some suspect the stones were only used on very foggy or cloudy days when making measurements of the sun were not possible by one's eye. The Viking had no known use of a metric compass like we have today or anything similar, so they would need something to guide them. What do you think? Can you picture what we know today to be big, huge Viking men holding crystal stones up to the sky to tell direction? Let me know your theories. I'd love to hear them. In roughly 985, the boat we're on, led by Barney Herjolfsson, is lost and drifting off course. We end up on the shores of a white sandy beach with a heavy tree line. Herjolfsson may have possibly found Canada accidentally during this adventure. It's said he walked the shores of the beach, pondering where he'd went off course. Many believe he was on the shores of Labrador. Regardless, that was not what he intended. He was on his way to Greenland. He'd quickly hop back on our ship and we're off again, back on course to Greenland. Once in Greenland, Herjolfsson would tell his good friend Leif Erikson about how he had went off course and how the land he had stopped on had so many trees. Erikson saw this as an opportunity to gather resources and of course explore more new land. Greenland had a short supply of trees and Erikson was going to get them. It was around 1001 and we hopped back on another ship. This time we're leaving from Greenland with Ericsson and Hordjolfsson at the wheel. We first discover on our journey what the Norse would call Haluland, which meant land of flat stones. Today, this is believed to be Banffin Island, a territory of Nunavut. And fun fact, it is the fifth largest island in the world. That's right, the Vikings were here in Canada 1000 years ago. I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty damn awesome. Back to our story though. In the Icelandic saga, it states that Ericsson would stop at Helu land long enough to walk along the coastline before heading south. Three days later, we would sail on to a narrow white beach, which stretched to the horizon and behind it were slopes and slopes of forest. The Norse would call this Markland, meaning land of the woods. Unfortunately, the vast tree line the pair spoke about seeing on the Labrador Peninsula can no longer be seen today. The location they were discussing is believed to be the roughly 65 kilometer stretch of beach known today as Cape Porcupine on the southeast tip of Newfoundland and Labrador. It is literally sticking out in the middle of the water, so no wonder they ran into it. The Norse people would refer to the beach itself as the Wonder Strands. But time to get back to our ship. We're off again. Two more days of sailing and we end up at a natural harbor and a land full of grass-like meadows as far as the eye can see. Ericsson would then find what he believed to be grapes and decided to call it Vinland. Some say referring to the wine, also known as fermented grapes and berries they ate, or some say that Vinland translates to the land of the meadows. Just a fun fact, due to climate changes, grapes no longer grow in Newfoundland naturally but it is believed that the climate may have been a lot warmer back then, allowing grapes to grow in the wild at that time. Newfoundland, just to point out, is on the same latitude as France and Italy, and we all know how good their grapes are. Historians, however, do not agree on the location of Vinland. Some, be some believe it is farther to the south. Others argue that it would be too far for them to travel or to maintain the location and make it back to the homeland as they like to do. Evidence shows that the Norse men preferred to set up base camps as if almost to test out an area first before actually settling permanently. It was a very smart move on their part, allowing them to collect knowledge of the land surrounding them, knowing what resources were within a few days reach and what were not. Also, allowing them to make an educated decision 
as to which land was best to settle for long-term survival, which back then, and even today, is everyone's main goal, survival. Not a lot has changed, my friends. We're all still just trying to survive in new ways. While in Newfoundland, it is believed Erickson and her Jolferson set up a base camp. This would allow them to double their time exploring the new land so they could come back year after year. The lack of game present in the cold Canadian winters would have animals moving south or hibernating, leaving the Norsemen with insufficient resources. Food remnants such as butter nuts found at the location suggest that they did move south to forage. For these reasons, it is believed more to be a temporary base camp rather than a permanent settlement. The group, including us stowaways on this journey, got drunk off the fermented berries that we found and ate. Whether they were grapes or not is always up for debate. Things like squash berries, gooseberries, cranberries were all known to grow wildly on Canadians' eastern shores back then. It is estimated that Erickson would come and go for around 15 years at his camp on the eastern shores before never returning. In 1004, Leif's brother Thorvald Eriksson set sail with a crew of 30 men to Vinland. He would reach the shores and set up camp with his brother. That spring, he would have a confrontation with some of the local people, which resulted in him killing eight of the nine people he attacked. The remaining survivor would return later with force to the Viking camp, and Leif's brother Thorvald was killed by an arrow that came through the barrier, piercing his chest. Erickson would eventually head back to Greenland to tell all of Vinland and the marvelous land he had discovered. Not us though, we're staying right here in Newfoundland because we've got some time traveling to do very shortly. So just hang on to that thought. While sailing home back to Greenland across the treacherous Atlantic Ocean, Erickson and his crew would encounter many men in distress whose ship had began to sink. Erickson and his crew would quickly rescue the men and Leif would become from that day forth known as Leif the Lucky. Okay, it's time for us to do some time traveling because it's year 1000 and something and we need to get to 1960 so we can discover what these Vikings left behind for us to find. Okay, listen close or you're going to get left behind and I'm not sure when the next Norse ship will be back. If you've got a hat, turn it to the side. Doesn't matter which one. If you don't, that's okay. The people with hats can do it for us. We're all going as a group. If you got a cell phone, Take it out, turn the flashlight on. Now close your eyes and no peeking. I mean it or it won't work. And the most important step of all, put your tongue to the roof of your mouth. And we're off. Great job, guys. Hold on. It's 1960 and we're at a location the locals call and I'm going to edit it here to be as polite as I can be. The Old Native Camp. There's a large group of mounds at the place today known as Lonzo Meadows. It's near a town called St. Anthony, pronounced Saint Ant Me by the locals. The mounds are covered in grass and look like possible remains of what is believed to be Viking houses. And we're in luck. Because Helge Instad and his wife, Anne Stein Ingstad, who are a wonderful Norwegian couple, but also trained explorers and archaeologists, they also are the ones who have discovered this marvelous place and need our help to dig it out. Pull up your sleeves, pant legs, double tie your shoes, and get those shovels out. We're about to get real messy digging for some lost history. We begin to dig. And quickly, with all the excitement in the air, discover we have eight buildings in front of us, and a ninth is pretty much in ruins. Eight main structures that were rectangular in shape and appear to be dwellings. When the Ingstads were asked what led them to this area to explore, they said they didn't believe the grape theory, but believed Finland meant land of meadows, as some do. With the help of some other clues, the couple was led to this location, Soon after that, they quickly acquired papers to start digging, and here we all are. The dig would last from 1961 to 1968, so I hope you brought some extra water. I forgot to tell you, we're going to be here a while. The camp is believed to have served as a base settlement for which they used to explore the land in search of foreign natural resources and such. 
Other suspected Viking camps are thought to be possibly in the Canadian Arctic. Don't worry, we're not going there to look. It's way too cold. Nanook at Tanfield Valley on Banffin Island. Nungavik, Willows Island, and Avialik Island. So yeah, you've all heard of them before, right? <laughs> to determine the site to be of Norse origin, we compared artifacts previously found in the Greenland settlements and Iceland from 1000 CE. The site itself is estimated to be from 1100 CE. This would also be the estimated date when Vikings first discovered our beloved Newfoundland that we call today. The site is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site as it should be since 1978. It's grassy and open and looks just like the everlasting meadows that some speculate its origin of the name Finland as opposed to grapes actually means. Also, 1,000 years ago, Newfoundland would have been covered in forests which have been a perfect spot for building shelters, boats, and iron extraction. This site in Newfoundland is the only confirmed Viking location in North America outside the settlements in Greenland. Okay guys, here's the fun part. We finally get to go over what we found. Throw those shovels away, put your comfy clothes back on, grab a snack, a big tall glass of water or a beer, and the comfiest seat you can find, cause you've earned it. Let's look at our Canadian Viking collection. We discovered eight buildings, that's right, eight buildings. They were made from wood and sod placed on top. All were either a dwelling or a workshop, and all had artifacts to be found. The buildings are labeled from A to J to help us describe them. The largest building of them all was a dwelling and had several rooms measuring 28.8 meters and 15.6 meters. If you need feet, that's 94 feet by 51 feet. It's known as Building F. Building J is believed to be an iron smith as it contained a forge and iron slag. Building D was thought to be a carpentry workshop and had a specialized boat repair area containing two worn rivets. Eleanor Bearclough, a lecturer in medieval history and literature at the Durham University in the UK, is one of the people that believes this site to be more of a temporary settlement and used as a boat repair facility. To further add to the thought of being more of a temporary base, some claim the winter camp allowed them to hide from the wrath of the Gulf of the St. Lawrence before heading further south to explore, or vice versa. When heading back after suffering damage to one's ship, you could easily stop and repair it before making a long trip home to Greenland. Buildings B, C, and G were much smaller, thought to be more of living quarters or possibly smaller workshops for various other tasks. Stone weights were also found in building G, and may have been part of what was used back then to weave cloth. They also found many everyday Norse items such as stone oil lamps, a wet stone, which is a sharpening stone, bronze fastening pins, bone knitting needles, and a part of a spindle, suggesting the presence of women at the camp. There is no way to know how many people were there at any given time or for how long. Archaeologists estimate that there could have been anywhere from 30 to 150 people there at any given time. The entire population of Greenland at this time was about 2,500 people, meaning if that amount of people were at Lonzo Meadows in Newfoundland, that was less than 10% of the Norse Greenland population trying to make it on their own. Not an easy feat for anyone. It's suspected that they stayed for no more than 20 years on and off in Canada and then never returned. In the Norse sagas, which again are written versions of older oral history, the Icelandic saga of Greenland and Eric the Red, who in case you're interested, is our boy Leif's father, both sagas speak of discovering and trying to settle a land to the west of Greenland, which they called Vinland. It states that the settlement failed due to conflicts with the local people of the land. Archaeologists suggest Lonzo Meadows is not Vinland itself, but rather a piece of it, they believe Vinland to be much larger, stretching south all the way to the St. Lawrence River Valley area and New Brunswick. Well, I'd say we did not bad for our first dig. 
Give yourselves a pat on the back because you just helped uncover some of Canada's connection to the famous Vikings. To my listeners out there, if you're interested in going to see this amazing wonder for yourself, for one, please, please, please do send me pictures. I would love to see them. And two, daily admission charge is about $12 Canadian for an adult and children are free. The site is open from the end of May to about the beginning of October. I will of course include a link below so you can check it out for yourself. Now that our job is done, let's explore some of the other places thought to have some Viking history right here in Canada. There have been some places like Point Rosie in the southwestern part of Newfoundland, roughly 160 kilometers away from Lonzo Meadows, where rumors of a stone used for ironworking known as a heath stone was found in the area. Shows can still be found online by BBC and the National Geographic Society at the time of airing Hope was that another Viking settlement would be discovered in Canada, but unfortunately in 2015 it was excavated and in 2016 it was announced to not have anything to do with the Norse being found. It was suggested to be all results of natural process. In 2001, Patricia Sutherland, who is an archaeologist and her team had been exploring Tanfield Valley on the southeast coast of Banff and Island, they discovered a wide range of evidence pointing to possible Viking presence in the area. Things like Viking yarn, a whalebone shovel crafted similar to techniques used by European masonaries at the time, wet stones, and stone ruins that bear the resemblance to a Viking building found in Greenland. Some remain skeptical of the findings on Baffin Island, as some evidence suggests that Tanfield Valley was inhibited long before the Vikings ever arrived. Patricia would present her theory in 2012 on October 7th to the Council for Northeast Historical Archaeology, which is in St. John's, Canada. She speculates that Vikings traveled to the Canadian Arctic to search for valuable northern resources. In medieval Europe at the time, the nobles prized walrus ivory and soft arctic furs. A group of indigenous people to the land known as the Dorsets were hunters and trappers at the time. They had a huge stockpile of the resources that the Vikings were likely after. She believes the Vikings would offer such goods as wood, wood carvings, bits of iron, and other goods as trade. If she is correct with her hypothesis, she could be close to uncovering a point in history not yet discovered, one in which the Vikings and the North American indigenous people were in fact possibly partners in a transatlantic trade route. She is quoted as saying, I think things were a lot more complex in this part of the world than most people assume. I don't know about you, but I would have to agree with her. How can we not think this to be possible? We have trade routes today and resources are constantly exchanged between countries. Why should we not think it is very possible for people in our great history to not have established such things? Because like I said, we're all just trying to survive and without basic needs and resources, we can't live. And there's no place that has them all. So we'd be forced to look elsewhere and possibly trade. I'm very interested in this and I'm going to leave it with you to ponder. Next we have Brigitta Wallace, a retired Parks Canada researcher. She believes in the saga of Eric the Red, an explorer named Thorfinn Korolsef travels to a land called Hop. There he finds grapes, tons of salmon, barrier sandbars, and indigenous people who build their canoes by covering them with animal hides. She believes there is a long lost Viking colony that has been lost in history. Her theory is Hop is modern day New Brunswick. She states the evidence points to the Miramachi Charlo Bay in the area. His description in the saga of the coast shore, the woods, the tons of fish and all that point to the eastern shores of New Brunswick where all these can be accommodated. She points out that New Brunswick is the northern limit for grape growing in all of history, so this was key in pinpointing the location. Grapes are not native to Nova Scotia, PEI, or Maine, so that rules them out. She also states that while sand barriers can be found along PEI, Maine, and Long Island, but are most dominant around New Brunswick, 
Another key clue for her was the hide cover canoes. These were known to be used by the Mi'kmaq people in the Maramachi Shaler Bay area. If confirmed, Hop would be the second location to have a Viking presence in North America. She also acknowledges that the butternuts and the linden trees that were used and found at the Lonzo Meadows location are materials that are only native to New Brunswick, proving Vikings had to have least been to New Brunswick to gather resources. She suspects it was only a temporary camp set up in the summer before moving south as no axes or weapons have been found in the area as of yet. Items like that are very much of value and will be brought with you from location to location. It's not like you could just stop and buy a new axe in those days. You would hang on to it tightly. Our next possible site is a small town known as Sops Arm, Newfoundland near White Bay and just 200 kilometers south of Lonzo Meadows. In Sops Arm, you will find a series of holes that archaeologists believe to be what are known as pitfalls. They would have been used to trap large animals such as caribou, deers, and others. In 1960, Helge Ingstad, the explorer and writer who discovered Lonzo Meadows with his wife, was taken to the pitfalls by a local man who was familiar with this area. His name was Watson Budden. Helge did believe that they were most likely used by Vikings, but did not look into them any further. In 2010, they were surveyed by an archaeologist who found the pitfalls to be an 82 meter long or 269 feet system of shafts in almost a straight line. Each pit itself measured about 7 to 10 meters long, that's 23 to 33 feet, and 1.5 to 2.3 meters deep, that's 5 to 7 and a half feet deep. Inside these pits they found large stones believed to be used to further injure the animals if they were not already deceased. It is also noted that no Newfoundland or Labrador indigenous groups of historic or ancient times ever used pitfalls in their hunting or gathering methods. Artifacts such as an iron axe, other iron rich artifacts, and a stone that appears to have a serpent carved into it representing something known to the Norse culture at the time have all been found in the area as well. There is a video on YouTube that I will of course include the link to that goes over all the artifacts found in detail. Many skeptics believe this collection not to be Norse but made to model after the Norse possibly by another unknown group. What they cannot argue is that the artifacts are very similar to that of the Norse but not precise. Well, that was an adventure indeed. I don't know about you, but I should sleep like a baby tonight after all that digging and most likely be dreaming of Vikings all night. But before I fall asleep, let's look back at our amazing journeys and discoveries. We found eight Viking buildings right here in Canada. I still can't believe that, can you? Did you think they were planning on setting up camp permanently and got scared away by local indigenous people trying to protect their lands? Or do you think they were temporary settlements set up to repair boats, weapons, and such? Please let me know. I'd love to know your theories. What about the ancient trade route? Thought to be still undiscovered. I personally love this theory and it blew me right out of the water when I read it. How could I not have thought of this before? It's so naive not to. We sailed across the Atlantic Ocean, from Greenland to Vinland and back again. We monitored the sun using our sunstones and learned how to travel through time. Shh, that's our little secret. We fought a battle and we lost our beloved brother all while searching for new resources, new hope, and a new place to survive. If you live on the east coast of Canada, do remember next time you're out walking along your coastline, you may just be walking where the Vikings once roamed. I'm Canadian Girl. Until next time, my friends. podcast recommendation for you. You're going to just love it. It's Small Town Secrets.
Small Town Secrets is a podcast that explores the secrets and strangeness of small towns across the globe, be it paranormal, true crime, or just plain weird. Every town has a secret. What is yours? Do you have a story to share of a town that you've lived in? Then head over to stscast.com and use the submission form at the bottom of the page. And it might end up on the show. You can follow the show on Twitter and Facebook at STScast. Available now, wherever you get your podcast. I also want to give a shout out to the Pod Sound School. They left a very sweet review on iTunes that I wanted to say a huge thank you for. And they have a very helpful podcast and YouTube channel if you're looking for tips to improve your already amazing show or if you're a newbie like me and they walk you through it all right from the beginning. I personally found some helpful tips about my mic and its placement as well as little tricks to help me eliminate those unwanted background sounds when I'm recording. I've also, of course, included their link below. Do give them a listen. Want to help support the show? You can do that in three simple ways. The first one, you can leave us a shiny five-star review on Apple Podcasts. This small gesture means so much to this podcast as it allows us to move around on the podcast charts and meet more awesome listeners like you. The second, you can stop by our souvenir shop and pick up a souvenir from one of our great adventures and take it on your very own. There's t-shirts, water bottles, notebooks, and so much more. Do head over to our souvenir shop today and grab some adventure gear. And finally, the third way you can help support the show is by donation. We have a fancy PayPal button that can be found on the top right of our webpage, nothingcanada.com. This button allows you the option to donate as much as you want, whenever you want. All donations will be used for the channel by buying new books for research, paying for the podcast website, and upgrading equipment. All three links to help support the show, of course, can be found in the show notes below. I thank you all so much for your support of the show. It means the world to me. You guys who always listen to the very end, I got a little something extra for you this time. I just found out my local museum will be hosting, I believe, something like 650 Viking pieces in a collection that has been traveling around the world for years, so you may have seen it yourself. It will be arriving here in mid-April, and of course, I am planning to go see it and take lots of pictures to share with you guys on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. So if you're not following me, make sure you do so, so you don't miss that. My handle on all three platforms is at NothingCanada. I hope you're all surrounded by sunshine this week and you don't have to use your sunstone at all. I'm Canadian Girl.